Lesson two, let's talk about the Bible. Let's talk about the Word of God if we can. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, it points out the fact that we have to study to show ourselves approved unto God. And what that means in the literal sake, in the Greek terminology, it means to search diligently. It means to also to give effort to, uh, to use speed. And so if we put all those different thoughts together, what it's basically pointing out is to put some effort into searching out the Word of God. If you never dive into the Word of God, you'll never have a good grasp and a good understanding of how the Word of God works. And so we're going to talk about that for just a little bit here this evening. We're going to dissect and kind of give a layout of, of how the Word of God works and how it's laid out. Uh, basically, just some general overview facts here. There are 66 books within the Word of God that we have, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. Did you know that there's over 1,189 different chapters? There are 31,173 different verses, and there are 773,692 words <laughs> in the Bible. And that may sound daunting, but really not too bad. If you do about three chapters a day, you can read the entire Word of God throughout the year not too hard, which is usually less than about 30 to 45 minutes a day. The Old Testament was written mainly in Hebrew. The New Testament was written mainly in Greek. Uh, we see that the printing press, and this is huge, in 1450 was invented, and the, the Bible was the first book ever printed on that printing press. Previously, it was only written by hand. And so we see how that definitely sped up and how it put the Word of God more and more into people's hands. And so uh, many people will ask which translation, uh, which, which translation should I read? Um, and so what we see here is, is that we recommend the King James Version. And then from that, you can use that from the New Living Translation or the New International Version or the New King James Version to refer back to it. Obviously, uh, every time something is translated, there is a little bit lost in translation. There's a little bit lost and just a little bit shifted in translation. And so every time that happens, there is a little bit of a shifting in that. And so we want to stay true to the most pure Word of God that we can. Ultimately, we want you to be looking. Ultimately, we want you to be searching. And so whatever, whatever translation you're going to apply and obey, well, that's the translation ultimately that we want you diving into. And so we look at this and uh, we, we realize that the King James Version um, will oftentimes be referred to as the first best translation that we can refer back to. So is the Bible complete? Many times we'll get that question as well. well. What about the lost books of the Bible? And there are many, but I will say this, that we have to hold on to the fact that the Lord has given us here in these end time days the most complete Word of God than at any other time in history. Just think about that. The apostles didn't have what we had. The Old Testament prophets didn't have what we have. And so we've got 66 most basic books. And what I tell people is, if you can't do what's in the 66 most basic books, then probably shouldn't be worried about what the other books are saying as well. Another point to keep in mind, that if we truly believe that the, the Bible is the inspired Word of God, and we do, then we have to believe that that which we have is a complete, what is known as the canon. That this is the complete Word of God. And those other books that weren't included may have never intended to be inspired or never claimed to be inspired. And so uh, many times they were left out because they were never claimed or never intended to be inspired Word of God. They may have been historical books. They may have been something that somebody just wrote, uh, some things that were just going on at the time, but not considered or looked at or regarded as the inspired Word of God. And so many books that were left out were left out for those reasons as well. Plus, some just didn't, weren't not cohesive. They didn't fit hand in glove with some of the other books of the Bible. And so that's why they were left out as well. And so if you'll look in your, your uh, 
glossary maybe, you'll see that the Bible is split up into a couple different ways. The first obvious way that you may have heard the most about is the Old Testament to the New Testament. And we've already referred to the fact that there are 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. Now we can further break those down a little bit more. The first five books of the Bible are known as the Pentateuch. An easier way to remember that, took means teaching, penta means five, the teaching of the first five books. The Pentateuch, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I like to say this is construction, the word was constructed, and then instruction. We were instructed on how to live. The Mosaic Law was given. The Ten Commandments were given. So that is a lot given in the first five books of the Bible. And then we move to, still in the Old Testament, we see that there are uh, a couple books of history. This is the children of Israel moving back into the land of Canaan. And this is a historical documentation of them doing that. But it's also inspired word of God telling how God moved on individuals as well as different kings, different people during this time period. And so we have Joshua, we have Judges, we have Ruth, we have First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Ezra. And then we move to the next classification within the Old Testament, and those are the books of poetry. And they were obviously given that title because of the way that they're written in poetic prose. And uh, we have in this, this particular classification, we have the book of Job, we have Psalms, we have Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. So if we look at these books, many people have referred to the book of Job as the oldest written book of the Bible, but because of the way that it's written, we put that within the books of poetry along with Psalms, which, you know, some of these books that we have compiled are actually a couple different books that are put together, and the book of Psalms is, is one of the first that we see to be done that way. And then we move to the major prophets. The major prophets are not called major prophets because they're just better, but because they're just simply longer and we have more of their writings to refer back to. So the major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Those are the major prophets. And then we move to the minor prophets still in the Old Testament. And what we have by those guys is it's not that they were any less significant. We just have less of their prophecies and we have less of their, their writings to refer back to. Some of these guys you may have never even heard of because some of them are only a chapter long or a couple chapters long. But Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Now we move into the New Testament. And this is where Jesus Christ comes upon the scene. This is where Jesus Christ begins to build upon those things which he had established in the Old Testament. And that's the easiest way to put it. He didn't do away with them. He built upon them and made a more perfect way to come to him and for us to be able to receive him with inside of our lives. It's a wonderful thing. Now, we look at the first four books of the Bible, of the New Testament, and that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that are four different accounts of basically the same type of story. They're telling the story of the teachings and the life of Jesus Christ, but they're just telling it from four different viewpoints. So you'll see oftentimes that these books will oftentimes say similar to the same things. They'll overlap. Some of the scriptures are exactly the same in what they say. And you're just telling a different viewpoint from a different person, and that's why we have what we have. Now, here's the interesting thing. Their teachings, the way that they lived, we're still under Old Testament law until Jesus Christ actually went to the cross and actually rose again on the third day and then poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost, which ushered in truly the New Testament. And so they still lived under Old Testament law during the first four books of the New Testament. We'll get into some of that later on. So we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the four, first four books that are known as the Gospels. When we get into the New Testament, which is where we live at today. That's why this is more significant. Uh, then we move into the book of history, the single book of history within the New Testament, and that is the book 
of Acts. Now, the book of Acts, is we refer to that many times, and it's important to look at the book of Acts because this is where the New Testament church started. This is where uh, many missionary trips were taken by Peter and, and Paul, and, and, and churches were established within the book of Acts. And so we see here that this is where the Spirit of God was poured out. This is where miracles took place. This is where all sorts of things that Jesus did in the Gospels, now the, his disciples are now doing these things in the book of Acts. It's very exciting. So then we move to, after the book of Acts, which is a historical book, we move to the epistles, which is another word for letters. So these are letters written to the churches or to the leaders of the churches that were established in the book of Acts. So that's very important to understand that. The churches were established in the book of Acts, and then letters were written for instruction and correction to those churches and to those leaders for those churches that were established. And so there's things that uh, generally you're not going to find in the epistles. You're not going to find the introductory way to be saved. Those things were introduced in the book of Acts. And they may be uh, somewhat corrected or, or directed in the epistles or the letters that were written. Mostly written by Paul. Mostly written while he was sitting in jail or in prison. And then we, we conclude the New Testament with the single book of prophecy. And that is the book of Revelation. Uh, written by John the Revelator, and we know that he was given credit to have written that while he was uh, excommunicated on the Isle of Patmos, and that is the single book of prophecy that we have within the New Testament. We want to pray, and I want you to pray, that the Word of God will come alive to you. I want you to pray that the Word of God would speak to you personally. Now, it's not of any private interpretation, but we do know that the Word of God being alive can speak to you in different circumstances and in different ways and can minister to you at different points and times of your life. So we want the very groundwork to be laid, and we want the Word of God to come alive within your spirit. Let's pray for that to happen. God bless you. We love you.